Proverbs 12, verse 11 says this. Those who work their land will have abundant food. But those who chase fantasies have no sense. Fantasies, the, the actual kind of word there is, is empty pursuits. Things that amount to worthlessness. Instead of moving the entire world for things that amount to nothing, work your land. Work your land. Your land, your, your ground, your fields, like something that is yours that when applied effort produces fruit. Listen to it again. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Work your land. So let's bring this out of theory. Let's bring this out of Proverbs and bring it into practice. Let's ask a question for a second. What kind of land do we have that when we work it, when applied effort, it actually will produce fruit? What has been given to us in our lives that we can invest in for good? This is group participation. You, you cannot sit quiet. What is some land that you have? Thank you, Janita. Your kids. You can invest in your kids and see fruit. What else? Okay, gifts. Talents. Somebody back here. Marriage. Your marriage. What'd you say? <laughs> yeah, you told me. I didn't call on you. What else? Your neighbors. Your church, your friends, that's what I said. She says land. I'm getting excited, Gary. Hold it. You didn't catch it, man. No, like your physical land, like the, the metaphor is actually a practical thing, right? Anything else? Acquaintances. You're going to make me spell that? <laughs> Did I do it right? It's close enough. You know what I'm talking about. Wisdom. Ron says, let's talk about Proverbs. <laughs> your job, your occupation. So let's talk about this for a second, Ron. Wisdom, as we defined it in this series, is this. It is knowledge, the knowledge, the truth of God that we come to know, but it's not simply what we come to know, right? Like a fool is someone who knows the truth and who is gaining knowledge and does nothing about it. And through, as you read Proverbs, that will become the, the primary picture that's painted, 
You remember two weeks ago, I connected this to the conversation of, of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and him, him giving us all this teaching and all this truth. And he gets, comes to the end of it and he says, a wise man is one who hears my words and does what? And puts them into practice. His, his house is built on a rock. And when the storms come in rage against him, his house stands firm. But those who hear my words and what? And does not put them into practice. Well, his house is built on sand. And when those same storms come, his house is going to fall. Wisdom in Proverbs is a conversation, and it's written from a standpoint of a wise father who knows, who has gained the understanding of God. Because God is the source of, like it's his world. He's the source of wisdom. Who is sitting down with his son and saying, let me, let me tell you how this ought to go. There's some themes that continue to occur in this conversation between, between a father and a son about how life ought to go. The things that he's learned from God about the way of man. And one of the first pieces of his concern, a repeating theme for the son to grab a hold of, isn't that slick? <laughs> your wife. It is of utmost importance for the father as he's coaching his son into a life of God. His conversation is, invest in your land here. Because if you do, things will go well. Listen to a couple of Proverbs of how he says this. He says, Proverbs 18, 22, He who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. Like God, God has a gift for you here. Work the land is going to be the constant refrain. Another proverb, Proverbs 5, 18 says, may, the fount, may your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now, I'm not going to dig into that one because we're going to come back next week and talk about what that's really talking about. It's going to be kind of fun. So, by the way, uh, next week, take your kids to Journey Kids because it's going to be fun. But there's an intention. Like, God, God has a desire for you to be blessed here. So gain wisdom and invest By the way, next week is going to largely have a conversation of what happens when you don't. So what does it mean for us to, to move into this? It, this, is a, this is a conversation that, that really is formative for us. The father saying, I have truth for you. Now let's do something about it. In Journey, we have a language that we call signposts. There are six markers that we've identified in the path of following Jesus into the kingdom of God. What we say is they're marking the way of following Jesus into the kingdom. They help us ask the question of where are, where are we at and what's my next step? How, do I, what, how can I now continue to grow? This series in Proverbs focuses and highlights signpost number four, pursuit through practices. And our key text for that 
signpost is James 2, 17. It says this, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. It is saying what the Proverbs say. Simply the, the gathering of information or even the gathering of belief, if it is not applied into your life, results in ruin. So how do we just simply invest in the land of our marriage, of our wife? Those who work their land will have abundant food. This whole idea is an idea of stewardship. It's an idea of investing what God has given so that the blessing he intends will come. In order to help us deal with what that looks like in in our marriage, um, I need a couple. Man and woman, I promise I will not ask you any questions. We're not doing the marriage game. But I need a couple up here uh, right now. Who can come? Come on, be brave. Come on. I will call on someone. There you go. Give them a hand. These are the Suggs. They're uh, community pastors with us. Uh, So welcome. Hey guys, one of the things that that I like to do in counseling and helping couples move into this uh, is play a little game. Y'all know how to play rock, paper, scissors? Yes? Okay, we're going to put, we're going to put an S for Stephen and an A for Amber. All right, we're going to play 10 times. Yes. Do you have a problem with that? Okay. So, The way we're going to do it, just so you don't cheat, right? It's rock, paper, scissors, shoot. And you give me the rock, paper, scissors on shoot. Do not jump the gun, okay? You ready? Okay, here we go. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, oh, come on. You're killing me. How long have you been married? Almost 15 years. Well, then do this together. You, You just count. How about that? Ready to go. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. All right. Go again. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. What did I do the first time? I don't even remember. Uh, You lost the first time is what happened. Number three. Here we go. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. (laughs) (laughs) This is investing in you're you're working the land yes. of your wife. Go again. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Go ahead. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, we're halfway done. Keep going. Look at her little dance. I very rarely get to be here. <laughs> Let me revel in this moment. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Oh. Keep going. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, two more. I had to learn. I had to figure what you think. Two more. Oh! I'm in your head now. <laughs> hey, y'all give them a hand. Can we take a picture of that in a second? She says, can we take a picture of that? <laughs> oh, I'll never be him. She wants proof that Amber won. <laughs> 
Stephen. <laughs> you invested. You like built her up. The reason why we play this game in counseling is because I want to have the conversation about the end of the game. This is a silly game. It really doesn't matter. But when we live life this way, it changes things. When we live life this way, we are not investing in the land of our marriage. When we are working in situations and in conversations and in even in conflict to win, you by default make sure that your spouse loses. When we constantly lose in our marriage, it changes things. When we constantly win in our marriage, it changes things. And what I would tell you in a counseling situation is that I would give you guys a 30% because this is the goal. The goal is asking the question is what, what is good for us? Because we have become a one flesh people. It's no longer about me or you, it's about us. Investing in the land of our marriage is investing in us. And sometimes it will require you to give up you in order for her to be cared for and vice versa. Investing in us always brings sacrifice. It's the way of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5 paints a picture of marriage that says mutual submission and sacrifice is the way of imitating God. So let's talk about that for just a second. There are all kinds of ways that we can invest in us with the way that we live in every category of our life. I'll just pick one. How about your time? Have you ever considered in your marriage that your time belongs to your spouse because you're one flesh? little fun exercise that you can do is to break down your world into different pieces. Look at your phone. It will collect the data for you. How much time do you spend each week on your phone? It will break it down based off of social media, based off of work, based off of texting. Like It will break it down for you. Just look at it. And then compare that to how much time, and I'm not picking on you, I'm a sports dad too, right? But how much time are you giving to invest in your kids in those things? And then compare that to how much time you, you give to work, to your job, because you kind of need to do that. And then ask the question, how much time, how much Interruptible, uninterrupted FaceTime do you have with your spouse? Did this exercise, I do this exercise often in my office with couples. 
And I will tell you, it is most often for that amount of face time to be less than 1% of their life. And so often my, my first step of homework is this. This week, go spend a minimum of three hours of uninterrupted face time together and start investing in the land of your marriage. What if we just started there? For the father speaking to the son about the priority of life, the constant refrain in this is treasure the one that God has given you. It is impossible for us to even begin that if we don't first give some of our time to each other. I want to give just a a shout out. There's a resource that I'd love to point you to. It's called The Fierce Marriage. These guys are Ryan and Selena Frederick. Uh, They are, they have a blog called The Fierce Marriage, fiercemarriage.com, that is just a, a great resource for you to continue this conversation of what would it mean for me to invest in the land of my marriage. Let's keep moving. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 4 says this, A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. All right, ladies. (laughs) And there you go. Like, One little disclaimer, one reminder that I want to give you here is Proverbs is written as a father having a conversation with his son about the way things ought to go, okay? That's why it's always going to be written from a perspective of a man about the woman, okay? From this side of the cross, we can apply this both directions, but let's deal with this, okay? A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. What this proverb is really talking about is the power that a wife has, the influence that she has in her marriage and on her husband. Ladies, I will tell you that there is nothing more influential in a man's life than you and your presence in his life. Nothing. My question is, how are we going to work that land and invest there? The language of this proverb, I understand what they're doing and why they, why they phrase it the way that they do, but it's not a direct translation. The the language, a wife of noble character, is not in the text. What they're trying to do is they're trying to explain what the text actually is trying to get to. What the text actually says, this is my translation, and I think it's pretty good. Let's go to the next piece. Is a woman of strength, this noble character piece, really is translate the the wording is a woman of strength is her husband's crown but a woman who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones i will just tell you steve bird it takes a strong man to be married to a strong woman A woman of strength is her husband's crown. What does that mean? Well, when you get to the Proverbs, there's very often it's this versus this. So to understand what a woman of strength is, is to understand what a woman of strength is not, right? A woman who brings shame is a woman of weakness. 
So a woman of strength is a woman that creates joy and pride. A, a strong woman is a woman that the husband is proud to show off. Like she, she has gained the wisdom of God to the point that she looks like him. On this side of the cross, we say she looks like Jesus. Because Jesus is the personification of the wisdom of God. She is a woman that in her speech, in her dress, in her interaction with others, looks like Jesus. She reflects God to the world, and the husband stands there and he says, that's right, she's mine. Like she is his crown. This is from the language of a, of a king, King Solomon, talking to his son, right? Like he understands the imagery of the crown and what the power of the crown brings. Like it is the image of his authority, In relationship with her husband, she makes him look better. And because of that, she makes him better. Like because of who she is, he ends up looking more like Jesus himself because of her influence. No, that's a, that's right. <laughs> Proverbs says it this way. Houses and wealth are inherited from parents. But a prudent wife, meaning one who acts wisely, one who applies the wisdom of God, is from the Lord. So husbands, It takes a strong man to be married to a strong woman. And I say that jokingly because I'm married to a strong woman. And she's strong in her, in her person. She's also strong because she knows him. My question to you men is this. Do you treat your wife like your crown? Do you, do you demonstrate your value of her? And do you nurture the image of God in her? The end of this text says, but a woman who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. Here's one of the ways that Proverbs describes this rottenness. Proverbs 11.22 says, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Like beauty is defined by character. Question for the husbands. How often do you Acknowledge your wife's beauty. Like really, how, how often do you look at her and say, you just, you're hot today. But more importantly, please do that. If you don't do that, we're, we're going to have a conversation either one way or the other. <laughs> right? But more importantly, how often do you acknowledge the beauty of her character? 
and invest in the image of God erupting in her. Like, catch her looking like Jesus and tell her. The next proverb that talks about these things, Proverbs 14, verse 1, says it this way. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. So ladies, there's two ways that you build your house. Number one, you, you make sure that the image of God is reflected by you in your home with him. Like priority number one, when he sees me, he sees Jesus when, the, when no one else is around. But the other way, ladies, that you invest in your house, that you build your house and not tear it down is when you are outside of your walls. When maybe even your husband is not around, you represent him well. Meaning this. You ought to be his verbal champion in the world. You ought to be the one who builds him up in front of others and makes him look like a king. We all know he's not. They don't have to know that. I want to tell you, Chris and I have been married 24 years. And in year number one, she verbally communicated to me, it's my job to make you look good. And she made sure that she was not going to do the opposite. Build your house, ladies. And watch your husband grow into what you say he is. couple more of what happens when this doesn't occur. Proverbs 25, 24, better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Or Proverbs 27, 15, and 16, a quarrelsome wife is like, this is one that gets quoted all the time, right? Is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil in your hand. It's exactly the opposite, ladies, of working the land of your husband. Last thing for today. We'll do part two next week. And it will be fun, John, I promise. Proverbs eleven fourteen. For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Here's my question. Who has access to your marriage? We use the phrase, I used it during the welcome today, At Journey, we walk together and make a difference. We are deeply committed to walk with each other in relationship as we become a people who act and think like Jesus. How's that going in your marriage? Because for lack of guidance, a nation will fall. But victory is won through many advisors. The church exists for two reasons, and I believe two reasons alone. Number one, to help each other in our continual growth in the kingdom of God so that we we are made to be more like the one that we're following. And then the other reason is to reflect him to a world that doesn't know him. Those are the only two reasons the church exists. Well, as we give glory to God. 
to help each other in this walk and to reflect him to people who aren't in the walk yet. Journey, if we will work the land of our marriages together, our lives, our homes, our church, our city will change. Who are your kingdom advisors? Who are others who know God, who have learned from his ways and his, his wisdom, and who will eyeball you and coach you into your next step as you live this life together in your marriage. Because guidance and advisors, it it begins with humility. It begins with us admitting, like, we hadn't figured all this out yet. Last night, Kristen and I had dinner with some friends who were here. Actually, I'll call them out. Ed and Gracie Arnold. And we shared our story over the last 24 years and some significant times in our marriage, at least two over those 24 years, that we really needed help. And the people of God were were with us, walking alongside us, encouraging the next step. Do you have people in your life that are close enough to see your blind spots and to call you out on them? If you don't, come, come see us. We have transforming community. That's how we do life. And I promise, with the applied wisdom of God, this land will grow. Because Proverbs 12, 11 says, those who work their land will have abundant food.